aim to redefine what we demand from our buildings. First, to take a step back, why do we have buildings? It seems like a simple question, but why do we have them? Buildings are so fundamental to our daily lives, so fundamental to the way that humans have adapted to live in various places, that as a phenomenon, they are totally ubiquitous. We invented doors to keep things out. We invented windows to let light in. We invented elevators to allow for taller and taller buildings. And finally, we also invented air conditioning to allow us to cool buildings where previously we could only heat them. And as the nature of buildings has changed, so too has, our role, has their role. Our society is becoming more urbanized, and as a result, we are spending more time indoors. We are beginning to realize that all this time indoors is having a fundamental impact on our health. The lack of access to natural light can disrupt our body's internal clocks, imbalancing our daily ebb and flow of cortisol and melatonin. Buildings host pathogens and molds and concentrate toxic gases such as benzene, uh, acetone, and formaldehyde, all of which are released by common household objects. In fact, building, the negative health impact of buildings amounts to $60 billion per year. So what would it mean to redefine buildings? We need to look to areas where we have failed in the past and design buildings that are more open to the exterior, allow letting in more light and air to create better spaces and happier, healthier, and more productive people. And yet, we also know that buildings cause 40% of CO2 emissions. Considering the threat of climate change, we also need to define buildings that, uh, design buildings that emit less CO2. And this poses a potential contradiction because one would typically assume that buildings which are more porous and transparent result in higher energy use and thus higher emissions. So how do we balance our goals of increasing the well-being of people against other targets such as reduction of emissions? Well, in fact, you don't have to because it is those exact same strategies which allow us to improve spaces for people letting in light and air as it is to reduce energy use. So who's doing this? Who can do this? I work for a company, Transolar Engineering, founded in Germany in 1992. Our founders, living in the age of the Chernobyl disaster, were looking for ways to improve society, improve people's lives through the application of design and alternative energy. Over the last 27 years, Transolar has done projects all over the world, from boarding schools in India, which are designed to be comfortable without air conditioning, to this iconic branch of the Louvre in Abu Dhabi, to art schools in Iowa City that are suffused with natural light, as well as to um, a law school in Baltimore, which has a fully automated facade to allow access to the outdoors. But I want to talk to you about one specific project. Uh, a building, an extension to an existing building we designed with Danish architects at Portland State University. Our goals were, of course, to design a building which met transolar standards for exceptional space quality and high performance, low energy use. But furthermore, we wanted to go beyond this to push the client and the design team to design a building which did not have a cooling system. This is not, even in Portland's mild climate, this is not an easy task, both for cultural and technical reasons. So how do we do this? Transolar follows three principles in order to achieve our goals, and which on any project can help us push the design to achieve what might otherwise be considered as impossible. So the first principle, performance by design. Performance by design is the idea that 
every aspect of the architectural expression of a building has to lend itself to the achievement of that goal of being high performance. The perfect example of this is a hydrofoil. Every aspect of this boat goes towards making it the fastest sail power boat available. Everything unnecessary has been stripped away. The opposite of this idea is that an architect can design any building they want and make it high performance almost in retrospect just by adding complex <coughs> technical systems. For example, a Hummer is a gas guzzler. And even if we put solar panels on top, it is still fundamentally an inefficient car. Back in Portland, every aspect of this building goes into making it such that it can operate without a cooling system. Air can come in through the facades, through the windows, into the classrooms, and is exhausted through the atrium out to the ceiling. Performance by design is an extremely practical philosophy. It lends itself to buildings which are legible, reliable, resilient, and elegant in their simplicity. The second principle is make use of environmental resources. This means understanding the climate, the sun, the wind, the air, and other physical phenomena such as the buoyancy of hot air to find resources to heat, cool, light, ventilate buildings without the use of electricity or natural gas. Humanity used to be very good at this, even not so long ago. This is a picture of the fire iron building. Early skyscrapers were tall and narrow, with windows that opened, allowing the buildings to be lit and ventilated almost exclusively through the facade. And check out how every single window has an awning. I can promise you those aren't there anymore. You had to block the sun with the awning from entering to stop yourself from boiling in the summer and yet be able to remove them in the winter to let the sunlight in. Nowadays, buildings all over the world look exactly the same. This is not just boring, but it is inefficient. The buildings do not respond to their local climate. They are wide and deep, relying exclusively on electric lighting, and without windows that open, they require a system of docks and fans to ventilate the building using more energy to provide less fresh air. And as a result, people in these spaces are suffering from the health impacts that we mentioned before. And so to apply this principle in Portland, we oriented the building towards prevailing winds. We wanted to work with the force of the wind to drive air through the building to where it needs to go. But our initial calculation showed that this building would be uncomfortable for far too long. In fact, uh, for 266 hours. Our target is 35 hours, which is the same standard that all buildings are designed for. We realized as a de design team that too much sun was coming in through the east and west windows in the classrooms and in the atrium through skylights. And so we moved the majority of these windows to the north facade and removed some of the skylights in the atrium. And this allowed us to carve off another three days worth of comfortable hours. The third principle is that comfort is greater than air temperature. This means that the factors which affect how comfortable a person feels are greater than just the temperature of air alone. In fact, comfort is a very complicated phenomenon because ultimately it is the psychological perception of thermal equilibrium. It is a feeling which can be influenced by other feelings such as frustration with colleagues. In buildings, the factors which affect your comfort uh, include things such as temperatures of ceilings and walls, 
contact with hot electronics, the amount of air movement, your clothing levels, as well as air temperature. And so, to improve comfort in spaces, it is more effective to deal with more than, to address more than one of these factors than just conditioning air alone. Now, to take advantage of this in our building, Transolar wanted to ensure that there was always a breeze possible, either through the windows or from ceiling fans. I cannot stress enough that ceiling fans are an extremely efficient way of maintaining comfort. But often they are overlooked because they are seen as outdated, unnecessary, or undesirable. And yet, these strategies, this strategy alone, allowed us to reduce those amount of that those amount of hours that were uncomfortable by nearly 60%. So finally, the design team added exposed concrete into the building. Concrete has this property that allows it to absorb heat and release it slowly over the day, resulting in lower surface temperatures and lower air temperatures. And with that, we were able to get below our, our target of 35 hours. And thus, convincing the design team and the client that we could design this building not to have a cooling system. So effectively, we are cooling the building for free, just by the fact that we are allowing air in. That's it. And <laughs> simple, right? And so we drastically reduced the energy use of this building as well as at the same time as making the space that was excellent for people. Here are two images of the finished project. On your left, you have the classrooms whose windows serve as inlet for the air. And on the right, we have the atrium that acts as the pathway for exhaust. And as you can see, these spaces are light, open, airy, and suffused with daylight. We achieved these incredible results on this project by following a philosophy which pays attention on the one hand to the local conditions of the site, as well as on the other hand, the physiological needs of humans. In fact, there is no reason that all our buildings can't meet these standards. However, it requires a reconceptualization of what we demand from our buildings. We have, in fact, if we want to live in a society that does something to address mounting healthcare costs, that does something to address climate change, then all of our buildings have to meet these standards. We have the knowledge to do this, and we have the power to implement it. Thank you.